Jesus left his regular normal path to go to a well of the Samaritans, Jacob's well, and to meet with a woman that had been ostracized in her village. She was a woman that only knew how to party. She was probably raised like I was, where uh, drinking and everything was a party, party factor. But nobody liked her. So when Jesus met with her, it was the afternoon. Most people got water in the morning where it was cool. But this particular woman got water in the afternoon because nobody wanted to be next to her. She was known as a party person. They didn't have nothing to do with her. But Jesus went out of his way to meet with her. You see, God doesn't look at the outer man. He looks at her heart. And whether you know it or not, that woman was a key evangelistic tool to win the Sumerian back to the Lord. So Jesus has a greater plan that we can understand. If we will trust him like a child, then God will lead us through the land. All right? A little poem for you. <laughs>
but it's also his house in earth. Did you know God had a house in earth? That's you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And when we corporately gather like we're doing today, we're a spiritual house, living stones being built up to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So God has a house, a dwelling place in heaven. Can you say amen? Let me blow your mind. There are three heavens. Don't freak out on me. Okay. Just so you know, this is an education. There's the place where God lives. Everyone say the heaven where God lives. It's called the heavenly abode. Okay. That's where the father lives, where he's never got off his throne. He's always reigned from there. He's always been in charge there. But folks, I don't know. I came up in a Jesus only type of background, but it isn't Jesus only. It, Jesus is the concentration. So everything he said, did, everything was, was a description of all three of them, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So don't get hung up on the Trinity, because I don't believe in that word anyway. It's a Godhead. Everyone say Godhead. God in three persons. The first Elohim. Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. Then the Word became flesh. Now we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? You just got your Sunday school lesson for today. <laughs> everything God does is good. Can we ever see anywhere in the Bible, I'm, I know you can't, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of baiting you. In the Old Testament, we see almost a different God than we see in the New Testament. You ever notice that? Hello? When people did things wrong in the Old Testament, the ground opened up. Remember, Moses is going up into the mountain, coming down with the tablets. What were the kids doing? They were worshiping a golden calf. And the ground opened up as Moses threw down the tablets. The ground opened up and swallowed 3,000 souls. Woo! But you see, that's the same God you and I serve in the New Testament. The difference is the covenant. And most Christians have no clue what I'm about to tell you, except for you, because we teach it. There's two covenants. The old covenant, if it was flawless, we wouldn't have to have a new covenant. So here's where Christians are. The devil guts Christians dancing from the old covenant to the new covenant to the old covenant to the new covenant. And they run on different principles. Someone say, oh me. oh me. So when you're living in your old house while you're having your new house built, please don't get upset because there's no running water. You're in a trailer watching your house being built. Well, listen, that's how we are when we try to live for God in the Old Testament. We fall short. We fall short. We fall short. We feel condemned. Well, all of this because that Old Testament was designed to point to human beings you cannot save yourself you need a Messiah now we receive Messiah we've come into the New Testament now God lives in your heart because you asked him to come in there now make peace with him and let him guide your steps trust in the Lord with all your heart lean not to your own understanding but in all your ways like a child Acknowledge him. Everyone say acknowledge. acknowledge. That means when you're at the restaurant, somebody says, Hey, what makes you smile? God in my heart. Don't be embarrassed about God. He's the only one that's going to get a job this planet. God in my heart. Now you got an open channel and we get to share. We get to share. Hello. Say, I have God in my heart. So it's new creation realities, folks. Haggai 2, verse 9. Now, everyone say ladder house, house. former house, house. ladder house, house, former house. Notice the term house, okay? Now, we're just starting here. I'm just kind of laying out the foundation. You're a house. The earth is a house. It's a dwelling place. You dwell in a dwelling place, a house. Can you say amen? amen. Now, okay, Haggai says the glory of the ladder house... I'm going to explain, is greater than the glory of the former house. Those houses are the Old and New Testaments. The Old Testament was glorious. Look at Moses. He had to cover his face and parting Red Seas and doing all these things. It was great. But if you got on God's bad side, it wasn't so great. Hello? So God had to find a covenant where mankind couldn't mess it up. Folks, when you make a covenant with two people, it's only as strong as the weakest one. And if one guy's a real weak person, one guy's a real strong one, then the weak one really needs to hide under the shadow of the real strong one. Sound familiar? 
God is the real strong one. We are the real weak one. We must ride under the cleft. Get in with God. Say amen. So that we get his covenant. Now, folks, you want to learn about the covenant of faith? The covenant of faith is the New Testament. All you need to do is have your faith in Jesus Christ. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. And what God the Father and God the Son did over 2,000 years ago in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his shed blood and his giving of the kingdom set a covenant in operation that you have Almighty God agreeing and helping you. Folks, you can't earn it. You get it by faith. You say, Lord, you made a covenant to help rescue me off of this fallen planet. I accept your son, Jesus Christ, and I want to walk with him. So I ask you to teach me about him and not religion. Everyone look up. Religion is man's idea to express towards God. We have all kinds of a religion. Okay, we are not religious. We have a personal relationship with God. Say amen. amen. Religion is man trying to reach God. Noble cause. You got Judaism, you got, um, gosh, Hinduism, you got Buddhism, you got Islamism, Bism, Bism. That's man's desire to reach God. Would you agree? Yes. But Christianity is the only ply, the only belief system where God came to man. Jesus came to us and said, would you like me as your savior? That's why Christianity is the only real way to heaven. Hello, say amen. amen. Even though we want and we want to be noble, even if you want to be good and you want to do the best things you can, it will always fall short if you don't let God help you to do them. For it's he that works in us to do his good and his good pleasure. He that's begun a good work in us will continue to work in us until the day we're, we're saved and yanked out of here. Hello. How many here are parents? Anybody grandparents? Do you send your son out in the mud and the crud just to teach him to love you better? Did I talk too fast? Let me slow it down a little bit. 60% of all Christianity teaches. You never know what God's going to do. The trials you're going through, he's allowing them to teach you something. Everybody hear that? You ever heard that? Yes. Yeah. It's taught everywhere. And it's not the truth. I'm a father. I don't light my stove and put my hand, my kid's hand over the stove because he played with matches. That's not a perfect heavenly father. And so what's wrong with the church right now is they're beginning to discover some of the stuff they were taught is a bunch of bunk. I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor in it into the house of man the things that God has prepared for them. Right? quote from the Old Testament. I'm kind of making fun of it. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. So the fact is Satan wants to keep you always carnal, always fleshy, always selfish because you'll never get in the spirit and God won't be able to show you things to come. So everyone say, not me. Not me. I'm going to walk in the spirit. And, and don't whisper because the devil's listening too. Convince him. I'll say this. This is kind of just a sobering thing. Some Christians, bless, bless our hearts, we only have faith enough to stay out of hell. We need to have faith to live a victorious life and learn the way of Jesus. Can you say amen? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when our life has a lot of disorder in it, you keep going to God and letting him give you order. Let him show your steps. Let him help. It takes consistency. Your favorite word. Constant exposure, folks. If you remember all those war stories and the atomic bomb stories, it says you get into that area where there's a lot of radioactivity, you're going to get radioed. You're going to get rad. In other words, it's going to get in you and collect in you and it's going to multiply and you end up dying. How many know that will kill you? But you know, what you need to do is get in with God every day and let him radiate you with his presence and his goodness so when you get up in the morning you're a success and not getting up already troubled 
I, I don't know about you, but sometimes we wake up troubled because we have a lot on our mind. We don't know how to cast our garbage out into the garbage can. At night, learn to bind up all your cares and your frustrations at night. Give them over to the Lord and sleep soundly and sleep sweetly. Say amen. Because you're not going to change anything while you're in bed. <laughs> Why does the devil do that? I'll tell you what. He's so, such a toughie. He went to your sleep to pick on you. He, he works at night, doesn't he? Creeps in at the bewitching hour. Gosh sakes. Amen. All right. So, you ready? Haggai. The glory of the latter temple or house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in the pit... And in this place, excuse me, I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. This is talking about the New Testament. Who's the Prince of Peace? Jesus. So we make peace with the Prince of Peace and we walk around in peace. Now you say, well, how come I'm not walking around in peace? Because if you'll go through your motions, some of the stuff you're doing is you're doing it. Amen. And not God helping you to do it. So we get frustrated. We get angry. Somebody calls you, doesn't like you, irritates you. So now we take all that around with us. No, that's not very smart. Why don't you give that to God right away and just take the goodness of God around with you? Amen. Soft answer turns away wrath. All right, so let's go on a little farther. Notice the two houses. Which house are you living in? Two houses, old house, new house. Which house are you living in? Check your bases. Make sure you're not saying things like, well, I don't know why my healing hasn't manifested yet. You're living in an old house there. Get that in the new house. Let me give you an example. When I had my old house waiting for my new house, just forget the house part. Okay, I stayed in an old house. The old house didn't have any flushing toilet. No running water. I was a hippie. My old house, I had to dig the toilet. And so we operated in what was offered us. That's the Old Testament. Old Testament couldn't save you. You couldn't get born again because nobody died yet. And nobody rose again named Jesus. So all you could do is serve God by faith and hope that he's going to be on your side because you're a good boy or a good girl. Now, check the Old Testament. I'm trying to get it down for your understanding. Now, in the New Testament, now your new house is built. You didn't build it. You didn't put the stuff in it. And you didn't pay for it. Somebody said, I got this new house for you, Sherry. You wouldn't believe this new house. It comes with servants. They're called angels. There's running water. It's got things where you could say, lights on and lights come on. And you could say, lights off and lights go off. And you could say, do this and it does that. And the, everything seems to be automatic where you're not having to labor to labor. Get it? You're dwelling in the new house. Yes, you will work with your hands and do that, but not to better your salvation. You will not be able to better your own salvation except meeting with God. He betters your salvation. Some would say amen. amen. And this is where we go wrong. We're trying to do everything just right and we fail. We get frustrated. We blame others. Say not me. You go to God and let the one who's the master mechanic adjust you from within. How many here are perfect now? You still need some adjustment? Hello? How many take your car in for a tune-up? Maybe tune it up yourself? Aren't you more valuable than your car? I'm going to pause for a second. I need some water. I love you guys. So, here, I want you to go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at what God's doing. All right, Isaiah, you got it? You're supposed to just leave that up there. Thank you. Isaiah, first scripture, supposed to be displayed. I know it. Don't, don't change it until I start going all through everything. All right. This is what God wants. How many know that in my father's house there are many what? Many 
Amen. All right. So, thus saith the Lord, heaven is my throne. So you now know where God's throne. I told you there's three heavens. That's where God lives, the universe, all the stars you see, and the air you breathe. That's the third heaven. That's where Satan dwells. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? Everyone lift your hands say, me. me. God's building you into his house. He's making you a temple. Amen. He's going to be a place where God can come in your heart and rest in you and help you walk with him. Someone say, amen. amen. This is your promise. God's not up there saying, Carrie, you get this, but Sherry, you don't. It's the promise. It's all of ours. How much do you want it? Verse 2, for all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, saith the Lord. But on one thing I will look. Here we go, everybody. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit. Do you know what that is? He's not about talking about you don't have any money. <laughs> And a contrite spirit, he's saying, poor in the fact that you need someone else to help your life. How many came to that decision when you accepted Jesus Christ? Amen. That's poor in spirit. You come to the end of yourself depending on God. Hello, blessed are the poor in spirit, they shall inherit the earth or the kingdom of God. Then it goes on, listen to this, then it goes on. But on this one thing I will look, he who is poor in contrite spirit, you're, you're humble. And he who trembles at my what? Why is God words so important to us? Because you can turn on the TV and you're not hearing the word. <laughs> you can go to your favorite uh, uh, news outlet, you know, and I'm not going to run anybody down. But they're not telling you the word either. You can go to school and they're not telling you the word. So that's why we don't look to man for our answers. We look to who? God, he can use man for our answers. But if you just lean on the arm of flesh, the Bible says you'll turn into a bramble bush blown around by the winds. Jeremiah 17, 5. All right. Ephesians 2, please. Verse 10 through 22. God has a house in heaven. Can you say amen? Amen. And we're going to see what house he builds on earth real quickly. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. It's talking about us Gentiles. But fellow heirs with the saints and members of the household of God. Back then, the Jews were saved first, then the Gentiles. Only two races of people God only knew of at that time, even though I'm Scottish. A believer Jew and a Gentile of many different flavors. Okay? All right. God opened up and he says, I have a flock that is not of this fold. Gentiles. And they also have a part of my inheritance. Hello? Now, I believe that God loves us equal. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male nor female, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. So look at your neighbor and say, you're better than I am. We're to esteem others better than ourselves and stay out of pride problems. All right, so he says, and then he goes on and he goes on further and he says, Of the household of God, verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, those teachers before, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being knit together grows in the holy, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, a house, in whom, I got the hiccups now, in whom you also being built up together, for a dwelling place for God. See, I'm a dwelling place for God. The whole thing, if you read the whole Bible and you catch certain things, it says all the time, when Adam and Eve walked and talked with God, it was all good, but then Adam sinned, God was thrown off this planet. Did you know that? The planet became Satan's planet at a short time. That's why Jesus had to confront the devil in his temptations. We don't understand. We're often religiously taught, but not fact taught. When Jesus was confronting the devil in the Mount of Temptation, he was threatening Satan that he's coming to rip this planet back out of his control. Hello? Even Satan said this. Now listen. 
in the second temptation, I believe he, he took him right up on a hill and he showed him all the kingdoms that were to come. And he said, all of these I'm going to give to you, Jesus, if you fall down and worship me. Now, Jesus came to get all of us back. So Satan says, all these human beings are my, under my control. They're my slaves. And by the way, the earth was a prison at that time. Hello? Christianity doesn't teach you that the earth became a prison at the fall of Adam and Eve. That's why it was so bad. That's why even now today things are so bad because people don't want to serve the deliverer, the rescuer. They want to serve their own selves and things crumble. We need God. Say amen. You love to put water in your car, but it runs on gas. It, your life doesn't run on you. It runs on Jesus and surrendering to him so he puts it back together. We're Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> Everyone, take a breath. Say, boy, this is pretty heavy stuff. Take notes. It's not stuff that I decided one day to give you or teach because you need it. These are things God gives me in prayer to share with you so you may grow. Linda and I have committed the last of our lives to share the word of God with you. We're not interested in, in making a big giant thing or trying to get, you know, we do the TV to get the word out horizontally. Okay, but we do have a real strong vertical relationship with God. Can you say amen? And we want you to do that too. So our life is spent giving to you what you need for yourself. Oh man, that sounds too good to be true. What did Jesus give you? How much it cost you? Look what, what it cost him. And he turned it over to you and you became a more than a conqueror. All right. So here we are. We're being built up together. I want to say amen. We're going to cover these four things rather quickly. Oh, man, usually church now, they just close and have prayer and, you know, pray for the sick and everything. Yeah, but listen, 20-minute sermon isn't going to feed you when you get a college education in evil the rest of the week. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You know. You know I'm talking the truth. Running down everybody, talking about this, blah, 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 blah. No, the pure word of God we feed on. Say amen. You pray for me so I can continue to give it out to you. All right, we're going to cover these four things. Number, what's in God's house? Number one, my father's house. I'm going to describe it for you. I'm going to show you that you have a place there. Two, God's earthly house. Did you know he has an earthly house? The Old Testament, the New Testament, and your life. Say amen. Thirdly, we're going to cover the New Testament. We are his house with power. And then fourthly, we're going to cover how we can corporately gather and create a revival. How many here have been following some of the revivals that are going around? Their first call is to what? Prayer. You don't see them doing anything else. They're called to prayer. They're praying for you. Those people going to the, and on their knees praying all day and all night, they're praying for revival to continue to come because the church is notorious for killing one another and talking bad about one another. That kills every revival that there ever is. Don't you ever be caught up in commenting and speaking negative. And if I tick you off, do yourself a favor and don't comment on me. Just take me before God say, sick of Holy Ghost. <laughs> Smile, y'all. Come on, you could smile. I think some people are so programmed about preachers, they think that we're, you never know what Pastor Kerry, he's going to turn on you. He's going, no, I'm going to give you the word. Say amen. All right, so let's look at this. Number one, my father's house. Have you ever had a vision of heaven? Let me see the hands of those that maybe saw a glimpse of heaven. I can tell you what I saw when I first came to the Lord. God showed me the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, this is in the Spirit. This is not physically. So I'm worshiping. I'm praising God. I'm just a baby. And God, I see this somebody so glorious, so powerful that the rainbows and everything are around them. And he's sitting on the throne and I can't make him out. But there's this glory coming forth. And there's someone that's sitting next to him that's just radiant but very compassionate. And then there's some kind of a glory that's moving all around up there. And God says, that is my Godhead. I am the Father. I have my Son. The words become flesh and have the Holy Spirit. We work in one. We work in harmony. And we never work separate of one another. So when you lift up Jesus, you're lifting up all three. 
Say amen. When you lift up the Father in Jesus' name, you're lifting up all three. They all three are actively working in and on you. Say amen. That is if you'll stop schooling around so much and just sit still and let God be God. Be still and know that I'm God. You guys, are you here? Smile up at me. How more? How much more is it going to go? All right. See, so you see where I am. Right. Anyway, so look at this. John 14, please. One through four. You know the scripture. It's one of my favorites. Sean Hannity used to use this when he started his little thing there. It says, let not your heart be troubled. Remember that? Do you remember all back then? My memory's blessed, so I... All right, so let not your heart be troubled. Verse 1. You believe in God the Father, believe also in me. This is Jesus. And in my Father's house, where? In heaven, in heaven yeah, are many mansions, many other dwellings. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for who? You. God's building you a mansion. Now, stay faithful to him. Don't worry about you falling down and getting up, falling down and getting up, because you're going to do that every time you think you've got it. You're gonna, God's going to show you you don't without him. And some people are so stubborn about it, they'll end up hurting themselves, getting up and saying, oh, I'm so sorry. God says, come on, let's keep walking again. Remember, God doesn't give us condemnation in the New Testament. I've come not into the world to condemn the world. John 3, 17. But the world through Christ might be saved. So even if you do fall down, you don't lose your salvation. No, you're just out of fellowship. <laughs> And you have to go back to God and say, God, cleanse me of that. I, I, that was just foolish. And when you learn to talk to God that way, he releases you all the time and keeps you clean. Amen. Hello. I used to hate it when I was a kid. My parents would take me to a barber. And all the barber would do is complain about the stinky kid you brought him. <laughs> I'm talking about me, okay? And so I used to, sometimes we have that idea about God. We don't want to get too close to God. He's, all he's going to do is show us our faults. You're his child. Do you lift up your little baby and you go, God, you're ugly. <laughs> You've done really stupid things. And, and I tell you what, I'm going to put you in the corner. You just cry all you want and then I'll come to you when I'm good and ready. This is the kind of Christianity has been taught for years. Hello, God doesn't beat his children. He corrects them. How does he do that, Pastor Kerry? He uses his word. Hello, if, you, if the word says don't do that, you go out and do that, and then it bottom drops out of everything, whose fault is that? Not God's. But then people come to God and say, why did you allow that to happen to me? Sound familiar? <laughs> Yeah, son, whatever you do, I have to allow what you want to do if you want to do it bad enough. So I'm telling you the whole time, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. You went out and did it anyway. So get up, sunshine, and get to me and let's get some cleansing going on. That's all. But we sit around, we feel sorry. We stay away from God's people for years. How intelligent is that? I didn't make your life miserable. Why are you staying away from me? Why are you throwing all the dogs away just because you got bit by one? Come on, I'm looking at you, Church of Jesus Christ. We have been a, been a bunch of wimps for too long. It's time we rise up and realize who we are. Stop fighting amongst ourselves, picking on the church down the street. Start focusing on the author and the finisher of our faith. Say amen. amen. I'm excited, man, excited. Okay, so in my father's house and many mentions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I go, I will come again and what? Receive you unto my so that's not the resurrection. That's the rapture. Jesus is going to one day come in and go, Whoo, poof. we have a clip of it. I can't play it today, but we're going to show you a clip of it. A bunch of non-suspecting Christians doing their own thing, going along, and suddenly two-thirds of them are gone. And everybody's standing around. Those are the ones that never had Jesus Christ in their heart. And if you've been away, now listen, I, I love this. I've been away from God, and I came back. But we've been away from God we need to reaffirm our love for him and we need to do it publicly 
because the Bible says if you accept Jesus Christ, then you need to tell somebody so it seals your salvation. If you keep all the good things of God to yourself, then you're not overcoming by your testimony. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and we love not our self-life unto the end. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't see any selfishness in you. You're the best. You know I love you. I consider you better people than me. And you say, why do you do that? Because God says to do that. I consider you honorable when I pray for you. I consider bringing God on your behalf and bringing you before God. And you know, that's a, only hum, humble people can do that. And I'm not trying to tell you I'm so wonderful. I'm just telling you, it took a long time for God to teach me how to be a meek man. Because I was a loud mouth. <laughs> I was one of those smart Alex. You'd say something and I'd twist it around and make you feel bad and then walk away. How many know God redeemed your pastor? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now I use those sharp words to release you in God and give you things to think about a little differently. Are you with me? All right, the earthly housing. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Book of Hebrews for some Christians is very tough to read. It's not really. Once you understand the theme of Hebrews... It's the theme that Jesus is better than all the Hebrew and all their religion, all Judaism. Jesus is the center, the heartfelt of God. So he goes through the book of Hebrews. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than the temple, better than the sacrifice, better than the priesthood, better, 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 better. But all of them have lessons for us. So in Hebrews chapter 9, look at this, verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. See, New Testament. With greater and more perfect tabernacle. That's the house, you. Okay? And not made with hands, not of this creation. So God created and recreated us to come and live in. Say amen. amen. Bad preaching will tell you, well, you better clean the house up. So if he comes in, you know. No, good teaching is go to God and he cleans your house. Okay, he helps you to grow. You go to him and say, Lord, I'm trying, but it's not, it's not working. I need more help. God says, good, thank you, because you were keeping me out before and didn't even know it. You know, we can keep God out of areas of our life by trying to do it ourselves. You didn't know that, did you? Lord, excuse me, I can get this one. <laughs> So what you want to do is, Lord, help me with everything I do. And let me know that when I do it well, it's your excellence in me that does the work. Someone say amen. amen. I've heard all these things before. Yeah, and that's why your life is so together. <laughs> I, I love human beings. We got so many excuses. Here's Adam walked and talked with God. He ate of the fruit, knew he shouldn't do it. Eve was deceived. Adam was not. So when God showed up, where was Adam? He was in the bushes, staying away from church, blaming his wife and his, his friends. I've been hurt, and that's why I don't go to church anymore. Well, I've been bit. I still love dogs. <laughs> you see how dumb that stuff is. Stop playing games with yourself because you're going to lose. Satan's a master to twist in your head right off your shoulders. So get in your heart and serve from your heart, not your head. Lean not to your own understanding. All your ways, acknowledge him. And he's able then to get control of your life and direct your path. And that's what we want. How many here know tomorrow if we walk with God has greater things than today? Now, you might not know that. But when you walk with God, it gets better. Yes. Trouble with a lot of Christians, they're walking for God and not with God. They're walking for God and not with God. You can't do anything for God unless God is helping you to do it. Amen. That's what's wrong with a lot of this preaching out here. The psychology preaching. You need to be good. Do this. Do that. Do this. Do that. And let's pray. And that's what you get for a sermon. That's psychology. 
Jesus says, do this, and here's why. Do this, I'm going to work with you. Do this, I'm going to be right alongside you, helping you with every move you make if you include me in your life. Someone say amen. That's how God wants to be with you. He doesn't look at your shame. He looks at your beauty. He created you. Say, I'm God's house. Now drop down to verse 23 and 24, Hebrews 9. Therefore, it is necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, God's abode, should be purified with the things, but the heavenly things themselves with the better sacrifices than these. See, in the Old Testament, remember they had to bring an animal. They had to sacrifice every year. And what did it remind them of? Every year they got their sins covered, not removed, covered. So it reminds them that next year they're going to have to do the same thing again. And the next year, and the next year, and the next year. But Jesus came to be the last sacrifice. So we come to him and we don't have to sacrifice. Hey, I want to serve God, Sherry. Hey, can I borrow your cat? I want to cut him up and so I can get before God and have some blood and have him receive my offering. Gosh, wouldn't that be terrible? We're still in the Old Testament. Find yourself a priest. Woo, Christy, would you go ahead and cut up the neighbor's animal? Let's get in and let's, we're, you know. Of course, we know it wasn't like that. In the Old Testament, not everything had to be stepped through just perfectly. And see, the priest had to go in, and first before he went in and cleansed the nation, he would have to ask God to forgive him, his family, and everything. And if anybody in the family weren't right, he would fall over dead in the presence of God. Now, there was a problem. Who was the next person to crawl in there and get him out of there? <laughs> so they tie a rope around his leg. So if the guy did, wasn't clean, and he, aren't you glad you're not in the Old Testament now, and fall over dead, they could pull him out without getting killed themselves. Folks, we're in the New Testament. We go into the presence of God, and you know what? When we approach God, he starts cleansing us. Amen. Who wants a stinky kid? Change the diaper before they get in there. Hello. And so we go before God. We cleanse ourselves and we meet with God and he changes us. Isn't it beautiful? Because I know some of you are doing it and your life has completely changed. And you were saved before. Things were going good before. But once you started meeting with the creator of your life, your life took on all the richness that he promised that we should have. Someone say amen. Amen. Okay, so we are his house. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. Here's a warning to us. Now, there's a lot of teaching out there that Christians are saved and they can go out and do whatever they want because they're still saved. Now, there's some truth to that, but the bad teaching about that is called the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Everyone say, doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They taught... That you can go ahead and sleep with your neighbor's wife, sleep around, fornicate all you want because you're still saved. And in Revelations, God says, in that doctrine which I hate, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which means that you can live your own life, God still saved you, and then he puts you in his little special salvation. Go ahead and ruin your life because you're still saved. How many know that's ludicrous? Yeah. You die and go, go to heaven early? Where do you think God's going to send you? He's going to send you back and say, hey, you're here before your time. <laughs> oh, no, God, I had a horrible time when I was down there. You're going back. Hello, I'm just joking with you. You see, God loves us so, and we're his child. So you need to get all that Old Testament being abused thinking out of your head because God is not an abuser. He's a lover. Can you say amen? Did you know it says the goodness of God leads us to repentance? Didn't say the terror of the Lord leads us? It says God will be good. I remember one time I was teaching the Bible study. I'm almost done with you. And, and my previous, I say I was married once before. And bless God, and she's still a, a wonderful person. But being married once before, I remember fighting a lot. We fight all every day, strife, fighting, strife, fight. If you are dating and you have strife and fight, that's not the person for you. Just, you see, because sometimes we'll be in love with an idea and not reality. 
careful. Anyway, so I ended up getting screamed out, told I was a jerk. I probably was acting like a jerk. And man, I, I had to go teach 50 people at a Bible study. How spiritual do you think I felt at that time? <laughs> and I said, God, all I had to do was say, God, I am really, you know, so my ex just dropped me off. He says, have fun, you turkey, you know. And, and she wasn't really terrible, but when we're angry, we say things we don't mean. So I'm standing there feeling hopeless. Feelings, nothing more than, remember that. Your feelings are fickle, they're not right. Make sure they're under the blood. And I said, Lord, boy, I sure made a mess of things. I'm sorry. And God says, Carrie, I love you. That's all he said to me. He just says, Carrie. I love you. And it echoed in my being with such power, I began to weep and sob. And see, he just knows how to make us get refocused. And I had one of the best Bible studies. People were healed, filled with the Holy Spirit. Legs grew out, arms, all kinds of stuff. We even had several teeth, had gold form in them. In fact, I don't know, were you with us when we were, we were having manifestations of gold, Scott, back in the day? Yeah, and uh, several of the people that got gold, uh, I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with it. Okay, but it happened. So they went down to their church and, and started telling everybody what God was doing. And unbeknownst to them, their pastor pulled them in the office and told them they were a bunch of ding-dongs, crushed their heart, and yet you could see the gold in their teeth. We're so quick to crush somebody's faith, not encourage them to go farther. I will always encourage you to know God and to make sure your life is good, brother. I was always, I will do that as your pastor because God will enable me to do it. But we need to love one another and pray for one another. Can you say amen? All right. And done. So we are God's house. It says, do you not know that you are the temple of God? Say amen. amen. And that the spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles, corrupts the temple of God, him will God destroy. Which temple you are. Now, you got, I got to give you some history. God is not going to open the ground and, and, and frustrate you. But he doesn't want you corrupting yourself. Hello? Do you know what that means? That means if you love God, don't become a harlot. Don't become involved in the world and think you can live both worlds because it will destroy you. It will crush you. Because you can't cross the positive pole with the negative pole in your battery. Can you? Can you? What happens? You short out. You heat up. You go dead. If you decide to get involved with the world and then try to serve at the same time, it will make you dead. You'll backslide and get angry. And Satan will put bitterness in your heart. We don't want that to happen. Say amen. amen. So there's nowhere else we can go but to the Lord. And you know what? He'll bless you and he'll give you friends. He'll make your life fulfilled. But we always seem to want to be in control of ourselves. Look at your neighbor and say, control of ourselves. You see, you know how you feel when you're not in control? Ever been in somebody's driving situation where they're not a good driver? You don't feel in control? Well, listen, when you walk with God, he is in control. If you keep giving him the control of your life, you've got to do it daily until your body becomes habitual. Habitual. You see, you need to hear and practice, hear and practice, and hear and practice until it becomes automatic. And most Christians, as they grow, it's not automatic yet. But Sherry will tell you, it took her a while, over and over and over, mom's prayers, and over and over. And the consistency, the exposure to God radiated them, and you become changed. Have your life changed any? Oh, wow. Amen. You have to hear her testimony sometime. And your sister. Amen. Your sister. Amen. So let's go on. So say, I'm the house of God. I need to take good care of it. Now, I'm going to say this to you, and I'm not trying to pick on you. It's not what you take in that's going to defile you. If you want to have a beer, 
I mean, I'm not condoning it. I'm a pastor. I don't really condone that. If you want to have a glass of wine, it's not what goes in you that defiles you. Jesus said that. It's what comes out of us. Do you know what he said? You know what he meant? He meant, and it has a lot to do with if we don't discipline how we talk to others and we're going to offend somebody, that's worse than having a beer. Now, here's what he's actually meaning. He says, you guys are so upset about what you see outwardly that you forget it's the inward man that I go after. So it's not what you ingest that's going to cause you to be corrupted. It's how you talk. It's what you do. It's how you are with other people will bring the corruption on you. Now you understand that. So am I condoning you to do that? No. But I won't condemn you. If, you, if you're sitting there and we had a great time and you pull out a, I don't know, a Smith Collins and you chug her down, am I going to jump all over you because you did that? You are God's child. I'll tell you who will. Just keep it up. <laughs> so I don't have to be your disciplinarian. You better not. You better not. I don't want you to resent me. I want you to befriend me so I can give you what God has given me for you. You see, God didn't have me preach for 46 years of this kind of teaching just to have me sit on it and just my wife and I vacation with it. No, God says, I want you to do this, do this, and do this, and I'll bring the people. Hi, people. Amen. Amen. Because you're giving out my word, son. You're not giving out your opinion. You're not giving out what you, you're giving out my word, and my word is what works in people's lives. Amen. Aren't you glad? So I don't have anything for you to join, but I have a coffee cup. You know what's, why we give those away? Until they last. Because you see Linda and I's little muggy on the mug. That's so you would pray for us. And pray that we continue to bless you and be a blessing to you. Amen. And then there's this other guy on the other side. And that, and I want to tell you, just want to tell you, and I'm almost done. That is the closest picture of Jesus I've ever saw in my life. Now, there's a couple of them where you see that Jesus' hair is cropped short. But let me just tell you, the vision I saw of Jesus, he had hair down to his shoulders, very well kept. Why? He was a Nazareth. Everyone say Nazarite. How many here know who the first Nazarite was? Samson. And what did he get in trouble for? He cut, got his hair cut against the covenant of God. So when Jesus came, he was a Nazarite. Nazarites have their own vows. And one is, don't cut your hair short. Because people back in the day that had their hair short, that means you were the village idiot. Stay away from you. You didn't know that, did you? So most people had their, now you do. Another thing is women were to grow their hair long because if their hair was short, that means they were caught and busted as a prostitute. And that was to tell everybody, stay away from that woman because she was caught in adultery. Now, we don't know a lot of these traditions because we're not Jewish, but I don't mind telling you. So guess what? Jesus didn't drink wine either. Oh, come on. He was a friend of wine bibbers and publicans. He was a friend of everybody that needed salvation. <laughs> so when he went into the temple, you couldn't get a good burger unless you went to the bar. Come on, I'm trying to relate to you. So he would go in, have a good burger, and drink some grape juice, and talk to all the people that were drinking and partying, telling them about eternal life. <laughs> oh. Jesus never drank wine because he was in Nazareth. He couldn't. It was against his covenant. And Jesus came to fulfill all covenant righteousness. So he couldn't even if he wanted to. Another thing you need to know, and I'm, I'm an expert at it if you want to talk to me about it, is wine is called wine even if it's vinegar. Yes. Yes. So from vinegar all the way out to the, what we call the good stuff. The good stuff, the proof stuff, the stuff with a lot of alcohol in it was the bad wine. That's what Jesus didn't do at his mother's wedding that she was at. He turned the water into what? Wine. And how much wine? Each, each container of wine was this tall and had about 40 to 50 gallons in it. Let's just go ahead and have a party. <laughs> 
besides the good wine. Everyone say good wine. Good wine. Is what you have today for communion. It is fresh grape juice. It was called wine. Then if you read along and you read, read about the wine, I hope I irritate your glass of wine in the afternoon. No. <laughs> Where the Bible says wine never came into existence until the fall of man where everything began to rot. What is wine made out of? Liquid rot. Let's drink a little. You know what I mean? I mean, Satan just mocks us. Sure, I, you know, back in the day, my mom made moonshine. We're talking about 120, 150 proof. Oh, so smooth. Turn you into a village idiot. <laughs> Did me, many a time. I could sneak it out, you know, we could pour it into a 7-Up can and then put the rest 7-Up. And you couldn't tell if there was that much booze in it or that much booze in it. It just got you buzzed. See, this is the stuff that the world has raised up in to corrupt us. But it's not the out things that corrupt us. It's what we have in our heart. Look at your neighbor and say, I have Jesus in my heart. How about you? So in finishing, folks, the last point is together we become a corporate house for God. 1 Peter 2, 2 through 6 says, Now as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Hello. Amen. How a baby goes after the milk. Can you say amen? Now, I don't know about you, but I still like milk on my cereal. All right, so let's go on and continue to read it to you. Okay. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as living stones, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. So guess what? When you and I gather on a Sunday and we start lifting up praises to God, God comes and sits in our praises. He makes himself at home with you. Hello, where two or three are gathered in my name, John chapter 3, says, there am I in the midst of you. God is walking in our midst right now. He's spiritual walking in our midst, but he's here. You have him in your heart. I have him in my heart. Can you say amen? So the thing we need to realize is that God really wants to be walking in our midst, healing our bodies, touching our lives, just as he did when he was here on earth as a man. Same Jesus. He just rose from the dead. So that same Jesus is right here. He's in your heart. But we've got to allow him the right to touch us, to, to fix us, to help us. And you do that by worship. When you say, Father, we worship, we appreciate you. And I know you're staring at a screen. You're still talking to God and you're opening up yourself so he can reach in and make all the adjustments he need in our hearts so that we shine from this day forward better than when we did. How many here hope to become better Christian than you were? How many here hope to become a better man or woman and really be a success? Don't you think your father wants you to have that? So next time you blow it at something, here's one that I did. I got to go, I got to teaching this kind of stuff. I got a hold of the word of God. You know what happened in my life? It turned around and I had so much freedom. I felt like it was weird. How come I'm not feeling guilty about anything? Should I manufacture a guilt? And God will bring you into places where you're, you're, you're so blessed. I'm not talking about all the time, but so blessed. It feels unnatural. Anybody besides me felt that? So what we want to do is just go stir up some trouble so we feel normal again. <laughs> Come on. We meddle in our daughter's life. We happen to offer our opinion when not asked. You know, those kind of things. Come on, smile up at me. I'm almost ready to close for us. Now, did you learn anything today? You have a father's place. He's got mansions for you. Amen. No one can take your mansion. Now, how do we get that mansion built? By your good works helping others. Like my, my new brother over here that just received Jesus. He was such a good waiter and he's so attentive. I remember one time I says, I put my hand on the table. You got to share this one. And it was just pile up grease. 
and we're going to eat on that table. And I looked at him smiling and I said, hey, can, he took care of that ever since. Just very attentive. Well, that's how God takes care of us. Ask him to get involved in an area. Don't keep areas of your life without asking them to be involved. Are you still finding you're short? Maybe you're, you're frustrated with your family? Get God involved. Ask him to help. Uh, you're frustrated with your mom? God, get God to help. We always seem to want to work it out ourselves. And how many know that sometimes that can happen? But how many know other times other things happened and it's just not working out so good? So, God has a house. We are a dwelling for God. The earth is his footstool. All of this belongs to God, but he then turns it back over to Adam and Eve, back over to us, and says, now you take my name and you go tell people about me. Who messed up in the first time? Was it a man? Adam, right? Adam messed up. So guess what? God is going to involve us to make it better. God wants your family saved, but they won't know how to get saved until you tell them. Amen. You say, you say, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me my sin, and be my Lord and Savior. That's all you got to do, and mean it with your heart. Now, you can teach someone that, can't you? Yes. Hello? Amen. Oh, right over there at Subway, I was getting sandwiches for my wife and I. Once in a while, we'll like a Subway. A little free advertisement, you know. There were some people who came in and God says, I want you to witness to them. One lady had a star on her cheek. Other guy was real thin. You could tell he was methane. And the other guy, I don't know where he came from. He's more like an angel to me because he was challenged, yet he glue. He had this glow about him that was really bright. Remember I talked to you about the sunglasses? You have a countenance that come out of you. And so I said to the wind, so I've been visited, we've been visited by angels twice. Physical form came and ate with us. Now you might think I'm nuts. Oh yeah, sure, Pastor Jerry. What makes you so special? There you go, thinking carnal again. Nobody's any more special than anyone else. It has to do with how your heart is, whether it attracts God or not. Anyway, I thought this guy was an angel. I could, of course, I'm not going to go up, hey, are you an angel? Right in the middle of Subway. So I said to him, I, I baited him. I says, you got a lot of God glowing on you. And you seem to know a lot more than you're putting up to. Immediately he got real nervous and took his bike and went outside, which tells me he was an angel because I was getting too close for him to confess that. He was following these two people because their mom and dad's prayers for these street people were strong. When the prayers for people are strong, angels go to work. They hearken unto the voice of God's word, what we voice in prayer, and they go to work. And so I dismissed the angels because I wanted to talk to them. An angel can't preach, by the way. He can only love and guard. That angel was their guardian. And so the funny thing about it is, when I got my sandwiches and after I shared Jesus with them, I walked outside, and the angel dude and his bike were gone. And he couldn't go very far because you can look right down the, the strip mall and see how far they can go and into the parking lots. This is over at Albertsons. Nada, nada, nada. Kind of like Samuel when he came to visit us that day. A little black guy named Samuel. I come out of my house. I'm walking down to church. And we were much smaller then. And I'm saying, God, it's going to be a wonderful day. I got some great things, you know. And I hear this voice. Hey, pastor, are we having church? I looked up the road, and here's this little black guy, bless his heart, walking down. He's just full of God. He's got his Bible class like this. I'm looking at him, and God says, angel. I'm so, isn't that unusual? Angels unaware. Make sure you're polite to everybody, because sometimes God will send an angel. If you treat him rude, you'll have a rude life. Treat them good. Treat everyone good. For some have been entertained angels unaware. Hebrews 13, verse 1. Anyway, so 
He says, hey, pastor, we're having church. And I looked up. Yeah, I said, come follow me. It was as if I knew him. He came over, was he casual, sat, wrote the word, got into everything, then stood afterwards and had a meal with us. Did you know angels can eat? Sure, Abraham and, man, you guys, we need to study the word together. They can eat, they can do everything you can do except take communion and the blood because they're not redeemable. They're already in God's hands, except for the fallen ones, which are demons and a few other things. But anyway... That was the second time. And so he ate with us and he shared with us. I couldn't get it. I couldn't get a phone number. Couldn't get a place to live. He just came off of the street. Um, no, it wasn't like he was canvassing or anything. And I said, Lord, what is that? And he says, I've sent angels amongst you. These angels are here to see how your people treat me and my people. Because if you treat them well, you will grow. And if you do not treat them well, you will have Ichabod written over your, your church. And even though you might have many, it places dead. So that satisfied me. I don't know if that's a total, total everything he did. But every time I mention him in prayer, I said, Lord, remember Samuel. I get this buzz in the spirit like, yeah, yeah. So don't you think that I'm anything special? I think you're better than I. The problem is, no, he's teaching you how to believe, how to really embrace God. He's a miracle worker. Amen. If I could stir you up, I will. He's a miracle worker. Amen. You are not. So you need to get with him so you become. So the Lord wants me to say, if you got any kind of mal nothing in your heart, uh, if you got any kind of situation, uh, achy bones, pain blurry eyesight Jesus is going to walk up in our midst and start touching you you ready for that okay so I need you not to be looking around I need you to be opening your heart and I want you to say Lord Jesus I'm at your disposal heal my body release my mind forgive me of my sins and minister to me Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move a little bit in the spirit, just what God tells me. There's somebody in here that's been having a bit of chest pain, little, little chest pain. God says he's removing that, and you're going to have a better circulation, better breathing, and you're going to be able to get around a lot better. So that could be one. That could be four of you. It doesn't matter. It's called a word of knowing. And so God has that healing. You just reach out and say, Lord... That's me. I receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. There's somebody in here that twists your ankle, and it's kind of a little painful. And uh, um, it's your left ankle. And God wants to... And there's people watching in camera, too. God wants you to know he's taken that, that stretched uh, nerve endings and muscles, and he's just taken that right out. Somebody in here has been suffering a lot of stiffness, you know, in their hands. I want you to take your hands and lift them up. Say, these are your hands, Lord, in Jesus' name. I break that curse, and Jesus, go! Woo. Now check him. How's that, sis? Freed up? I want to tell you something. A lot of times in our past, we either are involved or we do things that sometimes can call the enemy at us. Back when I was a kid, I played with Ouija boards. I was a rock and roll drummer. We were always in the occult. But when I came to, to the Lord, I had to renounce all that and got free. But sometimes those little things will try to come back. If you ever have been a Christian, you just can't get a breakthrough. That's what that is. You just say, Lord, cleanse me of everything that might have brought this thing. I bind it up. I cast it from me. And I break the curse in Jesus' name. And when you do that, you'll feel a liberty. Now, I'm not saying everybody has that. I'm just saying once in a while, we'll have a case where somebody can't get their needs met. Just seems like nothing works. They're always clumsy. They're always falling into disaster. It just seems like there's something there in control other than God. Break that curse. Doesn't matter where they were born. Okay? Doesn't matter about those sins. You can break them. Old Testament says the curses will be visited from four generations. But folks, we're in the what testament? Yeah. So guess what? We're redeemed from the 
So anytime the enemy is trying to hang around without your permission, you just tell them in Jesus' name where to go. And do it from your heart, not from your head. No rail on them. You turkey split though, you hang on, you ugly looking thing, I'll bind you up. Don't do things like that. That's your flesh. And Satan loves to play with your flesh. Hello. That's why we try not to walk in it. Did you get something out of that this morning? Do you know I love you? All right. So.